Looks great over there. What's going on, everybody? We're here. We're not actually live right now. Welcome to a brand new Poker Live podcast. My name is Jordan Gamon, aka Chicago Joey, coming to you from uh, from from GTO headquarters out here in Las Vegas. We got a big week coming up here, guys. Uh, this is going to be posting on a Friday. On Saturday, I'm going to be going over some hands and uh, picking up my favorite hands from the Super High Roller Bowl Cash Game that took place yesterday on Poker Go. Next Monday, we're going to be having on Scar Maker who, if you guys remember my Party Poker Million stream, he was the 21-year-old who satellited in for $5 and then got third place and won $1.3 million from Slovenia. We're going to have him on the podcast, talk more with him. And we're going to be having Dan Smith on the podcast on Tuesday. And uh, he's going to be playing Super High Roller Bowl as well at 300K, which is coming up next week. So, uh, so yeah, it's going to be a big week for content. And uh, that's it, man. Joining me today on the podcast is a man we've had on before after he made a deep run in the World Series of Poker Las Vegas edition, and now he's been lucky enough to be victorious in the World Series of Poker main event Europe edition, and uh, he is a man that I'm excited to talk to, an out-of-line comrade. He is one of the generals of the out-of-line department over in Europe, and uh, we got my man Jack Sinclair on the podcast. What's up, Jack? Welcome back, brother. What's going on, man? Howdy. Uh, it's good to be back. That thing is good. I'm in Prague at the moment. Just chilling out, losing a lot of money, as you do. Is that what happens in Prague? I don't know. I thought Prague was was just a lot of online activity with with with. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't want, your mom might be watching. Let's <laughs> wait for that later on. So, what's going on, man? How how's it been since you won the main event, World Series Poker Main Event Europe? You took it down. You took down the title. You took down the money. How's it feel? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it feels like ancient history now. You know, it was like over. It was like uh, like forty days or something. Not that I'm counting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was obviously pretty special, like, uh, getting the, getting the bracelet and the, and shipping a mill ball, always nice. Um, but yeah, you know, I just got right back on the grind, went to the Bahamas, played there, went, came to, went to Ireland, played there, came to, I mean, went to London, played there and now I'm in Prague. So, you know, it feels like a long time ago and, uh, you know, I haven't won anything since. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit, uh, tilted if any, if I have to be honest. So you have a big score at the World Series Poker Europe, and then you get back on the grind immediately, and you go on a big downswing. So I guess <laughs> let's talk about that. So how do you, you know, what 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 exactly motivated you to to get right back after it after a big score like that? Well, I mean, I already had my room booked at the next stop, so you know, I wasn't going to skip it. It was an expensive one as well. The the Bahamas, you know, it's not cheap mm -hmm. flights and uh, hotels there. But I mean, also it was meant to be a big old party, you know, like it's even called the Caribbean poker party. So I can't really skip this one right after you win a big thing. The other th the thing is I didn't party in that much in Rosadov because everyone had left. I had no rail. Uh, when I won, they, they brought around a champagne bottle and four glasses and I took one and then I looked around and then I, I got one of the commentators. He came and, and he had a glass and then the other two were just like, I was like, well, I guess I'm having three. Or maybe the cameraman wants up there. I don't know. But I had no rail, you know. So I, I wanted to see my friends, you know, and go to the Bahamas and hang out there, party a bit, uh, which I did. And, you know, it wasn't a bad trip for me, really. I, you know, I cashed the main, you know, whatever. Didn't lose too much. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with motivation to go to these stops, you know. I really enjoy all of them. And, and uh, I'm always just, like, kind of happy to get on, on the road, you know. Sometimes I get tired and I'm like, okay, I want to take some time off. And then like three days not playing any poker, I'm like, okay, I, I just got to go to the next one. Do, do you feel like there's any correlation between the success you may have had in that main event and in something like that when your friends aren't there and the rail isn't there and the party isn't there and the bad influences aren't there? Or do you feel like there is, uh, there is not a correlation for you when it comes to those things? Yeah, that's a tough question. I mean... Uh... I there was a lot of partying going on when I made the deep run in the main event in Vegas, as you mm -hmm. know. I, I, I did see you out, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were out together between day one and day two, if you were. Um, <laughs> but so, I mean, I can't say there's that much correlation. I'm trying to think. I mean, I've when I was, I, I've had a rail that time, and I won a, another tournament in Rosvedov last year, which was I also <clears throat> had a rail, but I, I wanted this tournament with a no rail and I want a tournament in Australia with no rail. Uh, so I don't know, like, I'm like, it's like 50, 50 for me. Like, it seems like me the main thing you need to win a tournament is a lot of luck. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, if, you know, if I had to put, put one word for it. So it's very hard to get a sample size where you can say like the rail is good or bad. My impression of it is like, I kind of would prefer to have at least one person there, you know? For sure. So one person that's watching the hands is there, can talk to me on, on breaks and stuff. That, that's pretty useful. But once you get past like two, three, I, I don't really know. Like, you know, having having a cheering squad, people clapping and stuff, it's like. Well, yeah, I would yeah. just assume more of like having those people around you, but then also having people that want to go out or they want to be drinking or they want to be doing things that aren't focusing on playing poker. Whereas maybe in a setting where it's just kind of you and maybe one or two other people, you can be extra locked in and extra focused and sort of know in your mind that all I'm going to do right now is play poker. And after I get done playing poker, then I'm going to decide where I'm going to go. Whereas when you have certain people around in your life, maybe you're thinking about, okay, we're going to go do this this weekend. We're going to go do this later tonight. And I feel like that can get into your energy and and it can really take away from your ability to totally lock in and focus when you're playing in the moment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, day ones and twos, that that can be a factor. I mean, once once you make a day three, typically like you, you cut out that stuff automatically, you know, I'm not, I, I've, I don't know if I've ever gone out, you know, the night before day three or so, um, you know, it's very, you know, it's common to like have one, two drinks or so before you go to bed. Uh, but, but in general, I, 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 once you make day three of a tournament, it's like, okay, now I just play this until I bust and then, and then can party. Um, and quite, you know, between day one and day two, it's like, you know, quite often you have a day off anyway. So it's not such a, such a big issue. And before day one, you can choose when you register, you know, you can start a little later. You don't have to get up at 12, you know, which is obviously horrendously early. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's like too much of a difference, but for sure, I mean, in Rosadov, you know, I, I mean, also the thing is I had friends there at the start, at the start of the main event, mm-hmm. you know, there were people there I knew and I, I uh, you know, there was a players party between day one and day two and stuff. And so, so there was stuff going on, but, but it was just like for the final table, there was nobody. I was, yeah. I was like, it was me. Um, Michael Marrakesh was around, but he was, he was busy playing a tournament when I won it. So he didn't even come, <laughs> he didn't even come see me. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I was just completely alone for the end, which was fine, but it was a bit of a bit, bit of a shame after, uh, I know, know after especially after a big, I mean, that that's the downside of having, you know, having an event like where it is so far away and once you're done playing out there, you just kind of want to go to the next stop or you want to get out of there because there really isn't much else to do out at the King's Casino. Shout out to my man, Leon. And, uh, you know, I, I can understand the desire for, for people out there to be like, OK, well, we're, we're done. Let's get out of here and let's go to wherever we're going to go next. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, no one's hanging around for day six of the main, you know, if they're not. I mean, there's nothing to play. So, uh, so, do, you so- feel like, do you feel like when you win an event like this, you know, I, I feel like in the past, maybe there was more prestige or more sort of uh, something that came along with winning a title like this. But do you feel like at this point in time, a tournament's a tournament for the most part and, and the score might be bigger, but at the same time, it's just another day at the office and sort of business as usual? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't have so much of a reference, you know. I've not been, uh, I've not been in the game so long. It seems like this one has a lot more prestige. I mean, possibly more than it deserves. I mean you see like there's there's people get winning mil- millions like you know every week seemingly you know right like every main event is like you know there's there's party poker events where they you know three people are getting getting a million like you know there's four or five you know it doesn't matter like every stop is like there's another guy that ships a huge event um and but yeah it seems like the bracelet is uh you know a, seems like a more prestige than some of the other ones you know and uh certainly like, uh, for example, like EPT Prague here, I think the main event does. I don't. It's a 5k, and I don't think you get a million first. So you know, maybe it's not not quite the same. But there's some, you know, Poke Stars main events where I feel like it's you know, you, just, you get even more for first. And I, I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm just happy to win one of them. I, I'm not really. I'm not complaining. And uh, I don't know. The, I, I, I'm, I'm 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 happy with it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I feel like the the you know kind of the allure behind some of these tournament wins is that sort of all marketing in a lot of big ways. It's it's what people talk about and what people perceive as a big event. And if people say the World Series of Poker main event Europe's a big event, well then other people out there are going to consider that a, a big event. Whereas if myself and yourself, we if we treat it like you know ah it's just whatever who gives a fuck, 
then people out there that are watching this are going to say, well, who gives a fuck then? They don't give a fuck. Why would I give a fuck sort of thing like that? So I feel like kind of as the players, you know, it's kind of on the players to say, okay, well, these events matter. These events carry more weight. If you win the super high roller bowl, that carries more weight than this. And because out there that the general public perception is so skewed by how the players react to things and how the players treat different events. And you brought up a great point in that there are these really big scores all the time. Now it seems like yeah. every, you know, now we got the five diamond, we're going to have something else. We're going to have this, the, the kind of the big scores in a way we're getting a little bit desensitized to them. And also the idea that a lot of people don't necessarily always have hundred percent of themselves. So when somebody has a big score, people out there are kind of getting more, in tune to saying, well, I mean, you know, did, how much did they have 5% of themselves or they have 10% of themselves? So I think that also takes away the allure for people. Whereas before or years ago, when people didn't know any better, if you had a $4 million score, they're like, holy shit, this guy won $4 million. When in reality, there's a good chance he didn't win $4 million. He's a good chance he had 30% of himself. And, and, uh, you know, now we're catching on to that. And I think people don't find that quite as exciting as someone who has the entire piece of themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think the, this particular event had a few things going for it. One, it's like, it's not a rebuy event. You could do one re-entry, um, but you had to play like a different day one. Um, it's a 10K, you know, in Euros, which is quite, you know, there's, there's not that many of them. Uh, so that's a little bit more prestige and, you know, it's a, it's a main event, it's not a high roller. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's got some things going for it. You know, it's, it's one that you're, that people in general are pretty unlikely to sell a lot for as well. You know, it's not like the the 10K in Barcelona where it was like a rebuy and it was kind right. of a turbo-ish structure. You know, there there you're going to sell a lot for that. You know, whereas this one, it's more like a you know time to gamble sort of thing. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on the uh, on the current state of the tournament world? Because from my perspective, it seems like a pretty good time to be a tournament player with a record-breaking feel for this online tournament and a lot of these tournaments hitting some of their biggest numbers of all time. And that of course, you know, might be because you can re-enter these tournaments and previously in years past, they were shootouts. But from your perspective, what, what do you, what do you view on, what's your view on the current tournament scene in general? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, for, for a live uh, tournament player that can, you know, that you can afford it, if you can afford it, I mean, you can, you can play more buy-ins than, you know, uh, the, it's just, you can just play so many buy-ins in the year. And you know, for the most part, they're very good. Like these huge guarantee events, like either they're going to overlay or it's going to be a good field. You know, it's not going to be as good as a freeze out version. You know, because by the time you get deep, it's like mostly good players because everyone's you know all the good players have rebought you know five six times if they if they were getting unlucky. Uh, so the final table is not going to be super super great to get. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, like in terms of the amount of stuff you can play, it's just insane. I mean, you know, I, I was thinking, like, I, I play online occasionally. I'm just like, why? Why? <laughs> There's just no need. I mean, I can, you know, get enough played in the year, you know, live that, I, you know, I can flick in, uh, flick in the online 5k, 20 million guaranteed. But uh, other than that, it's like, you know, just, just, uh, there's so many binds live and, and they're all seem, you know, pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not like there's, uh, you know, it's it's not like the the World Series of Poker main event is happening, you know, every, every two weeks. But these main events aren't bad, you know. Right. Yeah, it seems like the uh, the state of things is definitely on the up and up, I suppose, depending on how what your view on reentry is and those sorts of things like that. And, and I guess thinking about yourself personally, do you feel like you've made some strides in your own game since the last time we talked, which was about a year and a half ago. Do you feel like you've improved in, in, in a lot of different ways? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's not even close. So you know, I've, the, the, the degree to which I, I mean, I feel like I was really, really bad a year ago, you know? Right. Um, but, and I hope that I think I was really, really bad now in a year's time. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of how it works, you know, every six months, it's kind of like the best you can play now. Like, let's say you play every day for a month, right? The day that you played your absolute best should be average in like six months. I feel like that's sort of what you, you should be aiming for, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's a point where it like becomes, you know, it, 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 there comes a point where like you, you sort of can't play hands more perfectly, you know? <laughs> like you don't get that many hands when you play live. Right. right so right. a lot of the times you're like short stack you know you play fine and you're not going to be able to make that many improvements but like 
you you should constantly be like improving. And in the last year, it's just been like insane. I, I've not. I mean, I feel like I'm completely different player to how I was when we met when uh, when we did the last podcast. What do you, what do you think? A couple of those qualities or those areas of yourself, whether it's soft skill or whether it's something specific to the table, where do you think you've made the biggest strides in improvement? Ah, uh, oh, that's close. Oh, that's that's a uh, that's a tough question because I feel like I've I've sort of improved every area of my game a lot. You know, uh, definitely like the live experience has been has been big. You know, like I feel uh, a lot more confident playing playing live tournaments now than I did a year ago. Um, like I almost like I feel like an experienced live player now. Right. Whereas a year ago, I felt like I was an online player. That Which was, you were, I know that the transition's yeah. interesting because when when we first talked, you were mainly playing online and trying out live tournaments, and now you're you're basically just a live tournament player. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, for me, like live tournaments, it was kind of like a natural transition. You know, I like um, I like interacting with people face to face. I feel like I'm yeah i have some not, like ability with uh with reading people and and that sort of thing uh and certainly like thinking being able to put myself in someone else's shoes you know which i think is a thing that a lot of people struggle with mm -hmm. with poker is thinking how someone else thinks um and that's especially useful live you know where you can literally take one look at someone and be able to get a pretty solid idea of how this person thinks you know just from the way they act the way they even though, you know, the way they dress, you know, how they, how they sit, these sorts of things, you know? Um, but yeah, biggest area of improvement. I, oh, I don't know. That's, that's a tough one, Joey. Well, I think, I guess I'll give some examples for myself. You know, I think some, a big turning point for myself was when I realized I needed to lock in when I started my sessions, because I had a bad habit of getting down three to four buy-ins and then I'd, I'd sit up in my chair, I'd start waking up. And I found that for a very long time, I just wasn't taking the beginning of my session I just wasn't focused that hard in and I don't know what happened. Like something hit myself in the, in the head with a baseball bat a few times. And then I was, okay, let's, let's wake up. And when I plugged that leak, all of a sudden I'd start having these, I'd be up with three, four, five buy-ins pretty quickly in a lot of my online sessions. Whereas before in the past that never typically happened. So I know just paying more attention to that and sort of realizing that that was a really big turning point for me starting to have more consistency with winning sessions. Whereas in the previous to that, it was just a lot of variance in my sessions and I'd be grinding for 12 hours to get up one fucking buy-in. And then after that, I'd be able to just play for 30 minutes sometimes and win a few buy-ins. And uh, that was that was definitely a huge thing for me. Yeah, I mean, were you warming up before your sessions? No, there was no, there was no warm-up. I don't, this whole idea of like a, a prime your mind, fader hole style or a, a, a pre-game mantras or pre-game game plan or sort of going over your mind and saying, okay, I wanna do this, this, that. For better, that was unfortunately not part of my arsenal for many, many, many years until recently. So do you, do you have something like that for yourself? Yeah, I mean, it, it varies. Some Sometimes we'll be uh, using the Prime Mind, doing uh, some other meditation apps, you know, whatever. Um, I don't use it all the time, but it's definitely good when you go deep in the tourney as well, you know, just like, just tick all the boxes, you know, make sure everything is uh, in, in order. It just sort of keeps you, keeps you calm, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, that's not such an issue, especially, you know, live poker, it's kind of got the warm up built in, you know, like the, the, you, you sit down and most of the time you fold for like a, a half an hour, you know, especially when you buy into these tournaments early, uh, you know, and you're deep stacked day one where everyone's like got loads of chips, like you shouldn't really be playing to out of line anyway. So it's kind of like you just sit down tell yourself, okay, we're gonna play nice and tight, slow, not do too much. And then that's like a warm up built in, you know? Um, so that's not too much of an issue with live poker, especially, you know, tournaments. I feel like almost uh, what you'd describe, you know, you come in and you're sort of like, not fully into it, you know? You know right. You're not going for it right off the start. I mean, I'm sure that's a problem in PLO cash, but live tournament, if you're not, if you're like kind of lazy and day one, that's like quite often going to be a good thing. Like people don't fold too much on day one and it's very hard to put them to a decision for a lot of chips, you know, or meaningful chips. So it's actually really good to play super lazy at the start, not mm -hmm. play too many hands, just chill out, get in the mix, you know, just try and make a hand, 
If you don't, yeah, it's okay. You just fold a lot, uh, and then and then really turn up the aggression later. You know, Did this you is high level high level strat from from <laughs> this, this is like improvement over the year. What have I changed? Yeah, don't 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 go too crazy at the start. Go a little bit more crazy at the end. That's, well, I mean, but listen, this is very this. I don't know. If people know it's about you. Very relevant topic for you specifically because you're a complete <laughs> you're a complete fucking madman at the table is literally capable of anything at any given time so i feel like especially for a player like yourself you know you've had some experiences where maybe you did sub and you're like man what the fuck i mean like it maybe it was good but what the fuck was i doing did i have to do that do you feel like that's one area you've made a significant significant yes. improvement in where you've just punted it off a few times and you're like well might have been good but did i really have to do that right there you know what, Jay? I actually got a bluff through with Jack Four off on the final table of the WSFP Europe main event, and it was so good. It was the best moment. I mean, it was totally, it was completely reasonable bluff. It was heads up, and I called Jack Four off, and Czech raised a, an open ender on the flop, and he folded. But I was still like, I really should just turn this hand over. But he's he, like, my opponent. There's no way he know he remembers this. You know, even knows this hand. You know, but I felt like just turning the hand over. Like one at a time, you know, this pot is four jack. Uh, but yeah, for anyone watching who doesn't know what we're talking about, don't worry about it. We're not going to go over let's it. Just say, let's just say <laughs> Jack, had a, Jack had a moment during World Series of Poker the previous year, which was in 2017, where he may or may not have made a slightly out of line play. <laughs> yeah, I'll just put it like yeah. that. We, we call this, we call it the punt <laughs> yeah we, we we definitely call it that maybe you learned that from a friend of yours who they uh I, we were talking about biggest punts of all time at world series of poker main event and um for better or worse friend of yours names came up in there shout out to anton and uh yeah yeah i mean well sure i mean i'm in good company right i mean joe chong uh come pops into my head as well um yeah you know, and you know that's the thing you know you make these things and then you you learn and you move on and you know the key thing about that was i really had to learn just to 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 put it out you know like to to not wallow in it and be like oh my god i just bluffed off you know this much money right. in this stupid spot you know i had to play the final table two days later and and i, I you know it really made me quite uh, mentally tough after that and in fact i i made a, a similarly stupid move on another final table that was streamed um which actually was more stupid even. Uh, I, I mucked a winning hand out of turn, which was pretty spectacularly. At a final table? At a final table. Um, yeah, it was, uh, but uh, yeah, it was the same thing, right? Like, I mean, it was more, it was a bit more retarded. Like I, I basically, I had Jack high, but I misread my hand. So I looked at my hand at the start of the hand. I thought I had Jack deuce off. It was a limp pot. I wasn't going for a bluff, don't worry. Limp pot, I'm in the big blind, Jack deuce off, I check. Flop's like three, three, uh, sorry, I, I thought, I think I have Jack deuce off. The flop's like deuce, deuce seven or something. And uh, anyway, this hand plays out, it gets to the river. I have like, it's like double paired with like a higher pair possible. The guy bets the river, I think I have bottom boat. I decide it's too thin to check raise. I just call, right? And then the dealer looks at me as like, you have to show. And like, well, I, I, I just called her. He shows first, you know? And then I look at my hand. I don't know why, because the dealer was like looking at me expectantly. I'm just like, I look at my hand and it's, and I have Jack three off. So I just have Jack three high no like nothing, you know, Jack three high, like even the kicker would play. Right. Uh, so, so it's not, it's not just Jack high. It's like Jack three high. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. And then I just throw the hand away. Because I'm like, ah, oh, shit, like, there's no ways. You know, I just, I just threw the hand forward a bit before thinking about it. And then I was like, oh, wait, shit. Like, he actually does have to show first. And then he tables seven high. Or like five high. Or so. I don't know. He just tabled something. And, and like, I had people asking me about this because it wasn't clear on the stream what had happened. Because obviously the, the graphics show call and it's got like the, the fucking tick or whatever, or 100% next to my hand. And people were telling me like they were like jumping up and down like yeah you got him Jack I call what a boss and then I muck it <laughs> and they ship him the pot <laughs> so that anyway I don't I can't remember why I brought this up I I kind of regret that now no okay so the reason is because after that hand I had and this was a significant pot as well it was a small pot but I ended this hand I had like thirteen bigs behind or something 
you know, in this limp pot. So that was a huge pot in terms of equity in this final table. And uh, and then uh, you know, I, afterwards I was like, "Fuck, what have I done? Like, this is this is like even more of a ridiculous punt than than the last time I had Jack rag off suit." And I'm like, "That these hands are gonna haunt me for the rest of my life, you know? Anytime I have Jack four, Jack three, Jack this off, I'm just gonna be like, you know, getting flashbacks like PS um, PTSD, you know? But but afterwards I was like, well, it's the same thing, you know? Got to just get back on there, reset the mind." get back to action i ended up winning the tournament and who knows like so do you feel like maybe that moment kind of kicked you in the head a little bit and you say all right let's we got to really really lock in here and then pay even that extra attention to focus in terms of what's going on right now i think it's possible um yeah i mean especially that time i don't know if it, it helped yeah i think it, it, the the event is drawing my focus away right and i have to then you know, overcome that and put my focus back. I don't know if it's going to be like more focused into the game after that, but it's just like the the mental toughness to like, you know, put it away and come back was just like gave me a lot of confidence, you know, yeah, long term. And, but maybe even For then, sure. you know, no, like I mean, to I come back. I, and then... No, I think that's very true. I think moments like that when you make a mistake, but you're still able to overcome it and you're able to succeed, that definitely is going to give you confidence in terms of in the future events, whether it's poker, or whether it's something outside of poker too. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I don't know if maybe if I, if I had not won that tournament, I would just be a, a, a nervous wreck and never play again, you know, because I, I just always, always assume that I'm going to punt it off somehow. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like who knows? We joke, but I'm sure this is something that happens to people out there. I, I'm sure we don't hear from them or we don't, know who they are because why would how, how would we know who they are or how they're dealing with but i would imagine that type of thing definitely happens to people out there where they get into their own mind and they're just not as mentally strong whereas we kind of take this for granted and saying okay you know we fuck up make a mistake let's get over it i think a lot of people out there might be watching this and saying yeah these mistakes stay with me for months and yeah. I, I guess for you is that do you feel like there's some sort of way where you just where you're able to get past that or do you think it's just something that comes natural to you at this point in time yeah uh it's, it's a good question i mean i've i mean i've read a lot of self-help books in my day you know like oh sorry self-development books because self-help sounds kind of lame um but you know like uh there's there's a really fantastic book uh the seven habits of highly effective people mm -hmm. a classic of the self-development genre by stephen covey and that book he talks a lot about you know anything that you can't control is is not worth wasting time about you know um wasting time thinking about and you know i always remember that and i always try to you know remind myself of that whenever like i am stressing about something that's out of my control and it's very relevant for playing poker because so much of the game is out of your control you know uh so it's and one of the things is you know the past and the past is like you know a huge thing that, that you know affects everyone and and it's something that you can't change right there's nothing you can do about it so yeah i think that that knowledge helped and you know just sort of like you know my life isn't so bad uh, <laughs> i can just get over these things you know mm -hmm. um i think i always think about like you know people who like lived through wars and stuff you know and and there's you know those people they had their you know their, their, their sons or, or husbands were, you know, I guess I'm just talking about women now, but, you know, whatever. The, they, they've gone off to war and they're just home and they just get on with things, you know. And uh, and that's kind of like the mindset, I think. Not that, you know, this is uh, not, not to compare my struggles spewing off chips to, to that of people living through wars. But, you know, I just try and, like, have a little sense of perspective, you know, when things are when things are getting you down, you know, have some perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great way to look at things. And I know for myself, if I'm ever wallowing in, in whatever position I'm in at the current point in time, I, I sort of try to think about, well, these other people deal with this or like my family members that I know deal with this. And everyone has their struggles out there. And, and when you sort of put in perspective and say, well, it could be a lot fucking worse, then I think that does going to help you make you feel better and help you get over things. And in the past, I never really thought that way. But as I've read more and talked with more people, 
think that's one big takeaway I have is that you just have to get over things and sort of realize that no matter what happens, it's never going to be that bad. And, and most likely you'll always be able to recover in some capacity. And if you have the mindset that whatever I do, it's going to work out, I'll do my best. If it doesn't work out, I'll do something else. I'll keep trying, whether it's poker, whether it's a business, whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship, whether it's whatever. I think if you have the mindset that I'll make the best of it, no matter what I do, then I think that makes it easier to deal with. And although to be fair, I have that mindset and it does allow, I, I do accept some sort of, you know, if I disappoint myself or if I don't perform up to how I would like to perform, I sort of just make the best of it. And I feel like that's actually been a hurtful thing sometimes because I don't really push myself to keep going in, in some occasions because I say, well, no matter what happens, I'll be fine with it. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's definitely a, on the other side of the coin where it's like if you're just always chill with all the stupid stuff you do then you're just going to keep doing a lot of stupid stuff you know right uh, and for sure you have to give yourself like a you know as give yourself a stern word you know have a, have a stern word with yourself in the mirror and be like you you don't do that again all right and then and then you move on you know you have to learn the lesson as well you can't just be like hey whatever happens is fine you know then you end up just just always being a uh, spewing off but i mean i don't know these people probably still win tournaments so. <laughs> what, what, what's kind of your vision of success right now jack when you think about yourself your current position in life whether it's poker related whether it's non-poker related what do you think about the idea of success what, what comes to mind for you ah oh, man um yeah that's i mean for me like i feel longevity is pretty uh a pretty exceptional thing in this game you know to be someone that's consistent and 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 survives for a long time i mean you know who, who knows like, i could be a i could be a real flash in the pan here could be maybe i don't win anything for next year you know next two years and then i'm like looking at my looking at my bankroll and starting to be like well uh, you know <laughs> it's time time to uh time to think of something else you know so in terms of poker, I think like, you know, it's not like I can really set much of a, um, much of a goal that I haven't like, well, I don't know, that sounds so, it sounds so arrogant to say this, but like, it, it I've kind of hit, I've kind of surpassed all the goals I tried to set for myself, you know, right. in, in a year and a half. And, and obviously that's just because of a lot of luck. I'm not like, don't be, you know, abs any, any more conceited than I already am, but the, you know for me like i feel like if i can last a long time in this game then that would be um you know uh, that that would be good for me to think that i've been successful uh but further than that i mean i think for me right now like the biggest challenges i have is like getting getting back into shape i mean there's this you know i've been on the live grind for like a year and a half and i have uh i, I have not not improved my body in that time hmm. i'd go so far as to say that i am um, a fat fuck now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I was well reimbursed for it. <laughs> That's what I say. But yeah, I mean, my lifestyle choice is definitely not GTO. Um, whilst traveling, I find it extremely difficult to right. to to like stay uh, in line in that regard. So so that's one thing that I would like to have some success in in the future. Uh, I kind of feel like the only way I could do it is to like take some time off and really focus on that. Mm -hmm. um but it doesn't really look like i'm gonna take any time off um so so i'm probably just gonna have to figure out a way to do it on the road um but it seems like people could do it like i've seen people that can do it so there's no reason why i can't i'm yeah, just I think, like I, I think like one step that i would talk to people about a lot in the past when they have this issue is sort of just trying to start with one workout really get in the gym yeah. for five minutes get in the gym for 10 minutes figure out something we I've kind of designed little at home routines I can do that don't require any weights or any gym if I need to and and kind of just start the process of being a bit more active or if you're someone who who succeeds more with dieting then just aim for one healthy meal a day or, or something of that nature and then try to build that momentum from there I know for myself when I fall out of my I'm a habits of working out that's what I just aim for I aim for okay I'm going to put a priority to say I'm going to go to the gym today for at least 15 minutes 20 minutes go down there stay off my phone focus on my breathing, focus on my form and just kind of start from there. And I found that helps me out in the past, but for yourself, you know, when, when you're locked in on poker, a lot of times those workouts and though that diet, you know, one day you're like, Oh shit, maybe I got to pay attention to that. And then you start playing for five days, six days. And 
very easy to go by the wayside. So I, I mean, maybe it does come down to something where you set aside two to three weeks and say, okay, let's try to establish some type of habit here that I can sustain on the road. Because when you're constantly traveling from, from Bahamas to Prague, to London, to, to USA, to wherever, you're in a new place all the time. So your systems are constantly changing. And, and yeah, it's really tough to just build a system while you're in Prague that's going to last when you go to that next stop. Yeah. Well, I actually did go to the gym the day before yesterday. So I mean, maybe that's, uh, maybe it's the start, Joey, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's all come, it's all going to happen now. But no, I mean, I even took uh, like a month almost <clears throat> when I went back to Malta, I played uh, the online series the, in the W Coupe and, and uh, Powerfest, I guess it was called. The, um, and, you know, that was like four weeks. I ate super good and I went to the gym every day for like 20 days in a row or something maybe longer and it was it was good and i definitely reversed some of the damage uh, from the previous year but i lost every day of playing poker i lost so much money in this in this period and you know i don't know if it's related who knows but <laughs> but, but it was like tough to it was for sure tough to focus on both you know like Sure. I could play all right in the evenings and stuff, but but like you know, trying to like review hands in the daytime and like you know study and like you know get focused for the session and stuff is really difficult when you're like you know eighty percent of your attention is on like the next meal or um you know and and the workout and everything. Anyway, <clears throat> maybe I need to take like three months off, no play, no poker, and and just uh, just just work on that and then come back on the road. You know. Re reformed <laughs> yeah i'm not but sure anyway. what the answer is that's something i always struggle with i said fuck diet fuck that i'm gonna have an awful diet when i was playing in poker every single day in the trenches and i certainly had a, a very terrible diet but i always worked out because when i was 19 20 21 22 i worked out every single day for the most part so that habit was always in place but my diet was never in place it was a lot of fat my parents raised me on fast food and candy gummy bears mcdonald's so it turns out that's what I was eating when my when my when I wasn't putting energy on there. I autopiloted to fast food, to candy, to chips, to Doritos, just because that's what I knew as a kid growing up. So it is kind of fascinating to think about that. And and now that's something I'm trying to still work at and get better at. But it takes so much damn mental energy for me. Even like right now, I'm trying to get better at organizing and cleaning. That's mm. still every day. I got to think about that every single day. And and then that takes away from focus, whether it's on content or whether it's I mean on that. Whatever. Yeah, cleaning, that's not even on my agenda. That's not even on the like list yeah. of things to improve on. I'm like looking at this room like, yeah, I mean, that would be nice. But like, you know, so, so, so would a gold plated toilet, you know, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, so so you, you asked about success. So we've covered poker and the the the, the body uh, and the other one would be like the, the, the personal life, you know, the old love life. And that one's a real struggle on the tour. I can tell uh -huh. you that. Oh, man. It's so hard. You're in like a you're in you're in a country for like you know a week or two at a time. I mean, what do you do? It's impossible. Well, <laughs> I mean, I can give you some strategy. On that, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we talk after the show. But no, the the thing isn't the thing isn't meeting them. You know, it's like it's getting. I mean, I, I'm talking about like getting a a, a, a serious long term relationship. You know, with someone Ooh. you really like. Mm, I mean that. that, ain't, that that that's a tough one. I mean, it, it almost has to be a very special circumstance with somebody who is potentially in the industry, which has its own issues, or someone who's very, 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 very understanding of what your current situation is. But either way, you're putting so much mental energy on your poker, and it's so hard to then dedicate more of that mental energy to a relationship, especially a long distance relationship especially with someone that doesn't fully understand what you're doing. And I know people can do it, but I haven't figured that one out yet. That's for sure. The troll traveling thing in the mix, that, that that's a whole nother wrinkle altogether in itself. Uh, well, I was looking for answers, Joe, but uh, I, I guess I have to keep searching. I mean, the thing is, it's the, the, the paradox is that like, or not, I guess it's not a paradox. Okay. Anyway, the problem is if you meet a girl that you like, um, you then you get immediately put into the situation where you have to be like, okay, either you're you're gonna travel with me all year, or I'm just gonna be like, you know, I'm gonna 
see you like once every three four months or whatever you know right and uh normally they're not happy with the latter and uh and that that can become you know quite an issue and and the former is just too much of a step you know like Big you step. you meet someone you like them you'd be willing to date and then it's like well but like do i want to a double my expenses for the year yeah <laughs> and more i guess right because you're like you know <laughs> It's expect and 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 B pretend, like if it doesn't work out, you just completely ruin their life, right? Like it's like hey, you know, forget what you're doing in where it is you live. Like come with me, we'll travel the world. It's gonna be great, you know. And it sounds pretty good. And then, but you're and you're paying for everything, right? But then, but then they like cut all their ties. They move, doesn't work out. All right, back you go. <laughs> it's like yeah, God. So yeah, well, the step is the idea of not not focusing on on getting a serious relationship, but more so focusing on enjoying the time that you spend with the people while you're with them. So whether they're if it's for a few weeks or a few days, or whether you you keep relationships with people in different spots or whatever, maybe focusing on having that as the goal rather than the idea of I'll find somebody long term right now. If it happens, it happens. But if not, you don't really stress out about it and 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 focus that much on it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that kind of has been the goal, you know. But uh, it can be, it, it, that can be a lot of a lot of drama, uh, a lot of. All about gosh. how you handle it, brother. All about you got to be uh, <laughs> how you handle it, my friend. Let me tell you, there's ways to mitigate that drama. It's it's uh, that's a whole talent you learn as you get older. That's certainly something I've uh, dealt with in the past and gotten better at. I think a lot of it just comes with the, being really upfront about it, really direct about it really honest with your situation, honest about what you're looking for, saying that, listen, this probably, you know, good chance this can't work out long term. Like it just, it's not going to, we might want it to work out, but let's enjoy the time we have now. Let's stay in touch. Let's be friends. Let's communicate with each other. But I don't see how it's going to work when I'm on the road here. And it's just, yeah, just kind of being upfront about it and just being direct about it. Yeah. That's a good strat. That's my, that, that's been my strat as of, uh, as of these past few years, just kind of be upfront, straight about it, straightforward about who I am, straightforward about how I think about things. And it's not always going to be the most popular thing amongst women, but um, that is a new strategy I'm trying. I think it works out well compared to the past when I didn't even know what the hell I wanted for myself. I certainly couldn't communicate with somebody else what exactly I was looking for or what I wanted out of myself or out of my life or out of a relationship. So that's a, how, old, how old are you now, Jack? I'm 27. 27. I, yeah, yeah, my God. Actually, I turned 28 in how many days? It's uh, 10 days. 28 years old. What's it like? I, yeah, yeah, 28. I don't, I don't even remember being 28. That's back in the. How old are you, Joey? 33 years old. Go, oh, I know exactly. Can't even... I'm still so sharp. <laughs> We're trying, brother. I don't know what it is. The gray hair is coming in now. All that online poker is catching up with me. All that stress on it. Every single daily basis, focusing on how much money I had, definitely taking a toll on me here, and uh, it's come, certainly coming. It's hey, you know, my my hair's going gray already as well. It's it's like it's slight, but they're they're there, you know. Mm -hmm. I do, I do know, I do know for the best. What, what what do you kind of feel like your biggest challenge is right now in terms of your life? Do you feel like it's it's something on the uh, poker front, or where, where do you where do you find your biggest challenges? <sighs> Challenge. Hmm. <clears throat> uh i mean yeah just finding somewhere to put all the money joyce that's the real issue uh, uh, no um <laughs> yeah i mean i think i, I kind of it's very hard to balance everything you know finding time for everything that's that's the real i think yeah probably finding time for stuff is is really difficult you know like it's just amazing how little time i have to do anything despite the fact that i don't have a job <laughs> you know I don't have to do it, you know. I don't have to do anything, but then I end up like, I'm like, oh, sh I have to, I have to go do this, wh whatever thing, um, and I and I'm looking at the calendar, and I just have like, you know, three days or something free in the next like four months or something. I don't know. It's just like, uh, yeah, that's the challenge finding time to do stuff. Um, also, just like, you know, really deciding what I want to do. <clears throat> long term medium term short term you know i just sort of like you know, i'm on this track now and uh just it's like a treadmill you know i just keep running <clears throat> and it ain't slowing down 
But I don't know. That's kind of a bad answer. I, I don't really, I don't really know, Joey. Like, it's not. There's not too much challenging me right now. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Obviously, I brought I brought up the uh, the relationship issue. You know, that's that's been you know a struggle as of late. You know, a few a few personal dramas have taken care, taken you know uh, have gone gone down recently. So uh, so that that was just on my mind a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and that that has been a challenge. But uh, you know, I think I think I'll get over it. Do you feel like you tie a lot of your your happiness into how well you're doing financially through poker? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I know I, I know I did for sure. <laughs> like my my life was all about how well I was doing at poker. That if I was doing great at poker, if my bankroll was up. I feel awesome. If it was if I was on a downswing, if I was struggling. It certainly showed on my emotions pretty pretty consistently. So mm. I know something that that I was very much because how could you not be when you're obsessed with it with an overall goal to get to a certain point? I mean, I, I felt like it's super hard to not live or die with the results of of trying to achieve that goal, and I think that's was an ultimate benefit for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty hard not to feel better when you've got you know when you're doing well. I mean, <laughs> first for a start, um, and I don't necessarily see that being like a huge. I mean, it's not like you should like just like win loads of money and then just sort of go, you know, just like it's all the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I feel no different. I mean, yeah, uh, like of course. And when you're doing badly, like you know, it's not like it's not going to affect you. I think, you know, when it when things don't go well, and you know, it's, you you're on that downswing things aren't you know it's it's important to like realize that uh it's not the end of the world mm -hmm. and you know maybe it is but you know you, you gotta do what you can to sort of like take your mind off it a little bit and sort of accept it and uh and just you know not 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 focus too much on it at that, at that point i mean when you're doing well you, you, could, you could spend some time looking at it you know Thing, um, sort of enjoying enjoying the moment uh, because you know not, it's not going to be forever right do you feel like you've enjoyed the moment since uh since the world series poker main event europe do i have to say that every time i guess i do do you feel like you've been enjoying the moment since that victory took place <clears throat> yeah pretty much I've been okay. I've been enjoying it quite a lot. Actually. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure? I don't know. Listen, I asked you when you came on. You seem like I mean I I don't know. Yeah, I mean you know it's it it was nice. You know it's good. Uh, yeah, very. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean look, I, I was absolutely ecstatic about it. Like you know the it it took all you know the next day I cried like a baby. You know I was I was really happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know I mean but now we move on. <laughs> get you get over it yeah i mean i mean no I, this is something that will i'll be you know i'll be proud of that victory for the rest of my life you know that's uh that's that's for sure i mean a highlight of my career obviously um and just sort of like a nice uh i don't know i would say it's a nice like end to a story if it was you know if it was the end but obviously it's not but I, mean, like I think come... these I think these accolades matter. I think these things are 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 when six years from now, me and you have a conversation. These are things we look back on and say, "Man, you fucking remember that? You won the goddamn World Series Poker Main Event Europe, brother!" Like that. I feel like those are the moments that that you want to have those highlight moments, and I think we need those highlight moments to kind of keep us pushing. When six months from now, if you're struggling, you say, "Fuck, what the fuck am I doing this for?" You say, "Well, it's to experience these great moments and put myself in these great positions." to have this ultimate level of success that every poker player out there strives for. And I think ultimately that's what keeps us pushing through it when we're struggling or even when we're doing well and we say, why am I still working? It's like, well, I want to get back to that point or I want to keep rising and try to get to this next level of, of, of success and whatever it is that is for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it also sort of is, uh, it, it, it gives you a level of belief as well. Like mm -hmm. that, it can you, you you can do it, you know. No doubt, no. can win can win that money, you know. That's uh, that's pretty important as well. I think there's. Uh, I mean, I don't know, but I, I it's I think there are some guys out there like that just don't really believe that they can do it. 
And uh, no, 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 Jack. There, no, no. I'm telling you right now. I've coached a lot of those guys. Those are the hardest guys for me to work with because I. That's stuff that I, I've never really thought about for the most part. I think I can. I believe myself to do anything if I set my mind to it. But there's a lot of people out there who do not feel that way. That are even winning players. These are guys that have been winning for years that don't believe that they can really take it to that next level or believe that the success is going to maintain. And they think that it could end any given time now. And and they've just been running hot or or something of that nature. So no, if you have that belief in yourself that you can come back or you can keep at it, I think that's a very powerful thing that some people take for granted because not everybody feels that way. Yeah. I mean, I still wonder if it's just like, if it's never gonna happen, you know, <laughs> like I still have that. Like maybe it's all just been a big ass heater, and, I, and I'm just a massive fish, and you know, it's all just it's all just gonna come to an end, come crashing down. But uh, but no, it's you know for sure. I feel like there are, yeah. I, they, but this is all just a feeling, right? Like you can't be sure that, right? Like, but it really, it really seems a lot like there are some guys that just are just it's it just won't happen because they just can't. They just can't believe that it's possible, you know, mm-hmm. for them to really like do it and, and you know, seal the deal when they get deep in these tournaments or, or whatever, you know? I mean, I think this is applicable to outside of poker, too, because I mean, I think of myself, I believe I could do some things, but I'm still a little scared to try them, you know, for a, a few different reasons. So I think and I imagine it's just like that for poker, where people are confident themselves and confident in their ability but maybe when the moment comes there that pressure just builds up in them and and whether it's a cash game or whether it's a, a tournament or anything like that i kind of think about you know i have a very limited number of tournament experiences right now but i uh the only tournament i've really super focused in on this this year was uh was a 10k world series poker plo event and did very well in that went deep in that event and that was something i feel like i dedicated i i don't know how people can have a life because my entire day in the morning, I woke up. I took a shower. I meditated. I was sitting there. I'm visualizing. I go to the t- I go to the table. That's all I'm doing all day long. I I leave. I'm at home. I'm eating. That's all I like. It's so hard. I don't. I mean, listen. If you're traveling, I I understand how it's super hard to really maintain anything out of there, especially with these multi day events where, like, you gotta be locked. I mean, how can you if you're not locked in? How can you give yourself the best chance to overcome that that luck and overcome that variance? And I understand luck and variance play a huge part, but you still got to put yourself in position to to keep making consistently good decisions at a high level of focus on a consistent basis because the, sure variance and luck are going to play a part in the big pots and the big spots we have but i think there are a lot of other spots that that luck or that variance isn't there and we might not realize it yeah i mean yeah if i if i'm playing like a you know one of these one of these, a big tournament or whatever and like you know going deep or something it's just there's nothing else, you know, it's like, it's that, and then you go to sleep and then you, it's that again, you know? And like, you know, I, I find it amazing that I get anything done outside <laughs> of poker, you know, like this, the stuff that I've, you know, I have that I, that I did, you know, whatever it is, you know, like uh, just whatever, like investments or, or whatever that you do. I'm like, how did I even like manage to do that? You know, like if someone sends me an email when I'm playing poker, you know, when I'm on one of these trips, like it's, you know, you can get a response like maybe, but you know, maybe in a week, it's just not happening. You know, I've, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when, when you're in there, you're in there, but then at the same time, I do still find time to like go out and drink and stuff. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm just like not managing it very well. Your, your habits for drinking have been in place for a long time. I feel like so. Well, maybe I mean, I am why... British. what do you say? I am British. I know that's what I'm saying. Like you're, you're <laughs> like, like my working out autopiloting is you're drinking. You're like, oh, I'm drinking. I'm used to. <laughs> it's like a consistent thing for yourself. So, do you, have you had any, uh, have you had any degen or out of line stories in the uh, in the past couple of years that you might like to share with the people out there? Because the people out there love degen out of line stories. They love it. Oh man. Oh. Oh dear. Careful. Let me think. Okay. Let me think what's what's safe for the pod, you know? Please make sure it's safe for the podcast. Don't want you to get in trouble with anyone or anything or any something. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, Jerry, I don't know if I could tell it. That's a good one. I think this is a good thing. Probably a good thing. No, da- yeah. no D-Gen gambling moments or anything like that? No, no, nothing I mean, like that? Um, okay, I mean, this one, uh, this isn't like... It's just one that pops into my mind. I just thought it was kind of funny. 
Uh, it's not really that degen, but there was a there's a high stakes poker player uh, that quite likes to play roulette and considers himself a winning player at roulette. By the way, it's all about the brain waves. Um, and this this guy, like you are not. There's just no way you believe that this this is the guy that's like you know spinning the roulette. Anyway, the story isn't really about his. Well, I'll, actually, I'll give you one example of of him. We were we were at WSOP Europe at Kings, and he decided that he, he was thinking about playing the hundred k right, but didn't have a buy in. So we went to the roulette table, and we're like, okay, we put three k on a number, and it's like a satellite, you know. So we had to we had to get Le- we went up and asked Leon specifically if we could increase the max bet on the roulette table because max bet was one k, and uh, and we were like, well, no, we're gonna put. 3k we want to bet 3k to win a sat you know as a satellite to the to the 100k uh anyway the, our strategy was to bet on a third with 1k and then if that hit we would then have a 3k buy-in for the you know second round satellite which was a number and if we missed that we did the same again so we had three sh- three bullets at the at the phase one basically you know like the third bet and then and then we got the, the 3k and that going on a number Leon comes over to watch us make this, make our, make our, you know, do our satellite, you know, so that he can tell them to raise the max bet to three k from one k. Anyway, we we fire the one k three times, bust all three, don't even hit, don't even get to the second round, and that's the, that's that for our for our made it for our high roller satellite. Anyway, I was spinning with this guy in Vegas, and um, <laughs> and we were we were at this table, and there was this guy with us. He was like betting, and and he would just like bet infinite stuff. Like there was not like numbers piles, like you know big crosses and stuff. And we just picked a few select numbers, you know, like we we know what we're doing, you know, we're not we're not idiots. And this guy was total bad vibes. He was betting infinite on seventeen. Like it was like a, it was almost like a like a one of those gravity, uh, this. You know, like uh, when when you have like the the, the the tiled floor and it's like bends to like represent gravity, you know. And it was like all for seventeen, you know, like this big sort of uh, pyramid for seventeen. Okay. And and he was like really really wanted that seventeen to come, and he would hit and like win money and still be tilted because he missed seventeen, like be smashing the table. And 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 the guy I'm with is like, no, nah, this guy's tilting me too much. We go to the other table. So we go to the other table, like five meters away and i'm like look i like his 17 strat though i think we should still bet a lot on 17 okay so about three minutes in we ping off the 17 no problem so we go nuts like we're like yelling like 17 oh my god it's the best thing ever and and we could see him looking at us like like tilt he's like man uh, that's just luck you know 17 is coming here for sure for sure about five minutes later, five ten minutes later, seventeen again. We hit, we hit the seventeen again. We go nuts. We're like, we're high fiving the the crew. Yeah, we're we're just making all the noise. We're ordering drinks. Everything's going crazy. We're up huge. He comes over to our table, and so he switches to ours. Puts all his bets on and stuff. Whatever he's gambling for a while. You know, he's there for like 10, 15 minutes. Gets two tilt. And goes back to his original table. Seventeen has not come up. Ten minutes later, seventeen again. We hit the, <laughs> we hit it three times. And at, the, <laughs> uh, at this point, he went home. I think. Uh, anyway, that was not a very good story, Joey. I know, but uh, this is the most PG one I have for you. So this what this was with the roulette pro who who. Uh... Yeah, this is the roulette pro. I mean, man, like after that night, I was like, okay, you know what? He knows. So, do you believe roulette's beatable? Is that what you're trying to say? You believe you can make it as a professional roulette player? No, I don't believe I could. He can. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying I can, but I wouldn't bet against this guy. Interesting. Is is his name start with a Fedor Holes? No. Hmm. Wait. You mean you mean is it Fedor Holes? Because the answer yeah. is no. Yeah. No. Right. Okay. Who, yeah, who do you think are, uh, do, do you have any do you have any any goal to play the high roller events at any point in time? Uh, I mean, I've played a few. Though. I played the one drop in um, uh, in Rosadov last year. 
the the hundred k. I played uh, a few twenty five k's. I played a fifty k in Russia recently. Mm-hmm. Um, like I play a few. It's, I mean, the the thing is with high rollers is like that the the EV is quite often quite similar between playing a high roller and a and a regular one. And you know, if if there's one running at the same time as like a good two k, like quite often. You know the EV isn't that like let's say let's say you play a twenty five k right like it's pretty hard to have much more than like a ten fifteen twenty percent edge right I mean twenty percent would be like pretty sick um so like let's say you're making ten percent by playing it well okay that's that's two point five k you make by playing the twenty five k if there's a two point two k going at the same time I mean it's very achievable to have a hundred percent ROI in that in that thing you know if if you're one of the good players. So, so already the EV is kind of close. Uh, even if you if you have a hundred percent of yourself in the twenty five k, right? Right. And then if you're like selling action and you have, you know, you have fifty percent, forty percent, whatever. I mean, now the EV is worse, right? The the benefit to playing high rollers is if you could charge a high markup, you know, because then you get free money, right? If you can charge, you know, one point one, one point two, or, the, or you know, well, one point. Some I get I guess some people are getting one point two right, but like you know if you can get like over one point one for a high roller, then you know you're making a lot of free money just by selling selling the action right because there's mm-hmm. a lot of it to sell. I mean you know I, I could charge a high markup for a five k, but then there's, there's just not that many, there's just not that many dollars or you know whatever to sell for. So I don't know I mean I don't know what markup I get for these high rollers. I mean yeah you know, I'm not I'm not German you know I'm sort of. Uh, that I don't play that many of them, so it's like it's like one of those things. Are you kind of it's you kind of have to play them for a while, establish yourself, and then maybe you can charge a high markup later. Right. But in the meantime, you're just like taking on a you know massive swings, or cutting your EV. So I don't know. I mean, I, it, it sort of I I play some, you know, I play I play the good value ones, uh, and I keep a big piece, or you know, and and hope for the best, and you know. I guess I guess you you win a few and then and then you can charge a high markup and then you you play them all, or you just have a bankroll that's so big you just don't even need to sell for them and then you can play them all. Hmm. So I don't know, you know, like that that's that's my view on these high rollers. <clears throat> I I almost always skip the ten k high rollers. I find like the the ten k's are the worst normally. Like I, a lot of the I mean not not all of them. Like the the one in Barcelona is really good and like the I think the last one here is going to be pretty good. I'll probably play that, but like. A lot of these stops you go to, there's like a 10k high roller and running at the same time as like a one or a two k or something. And I'm I'm always looking at this 10k. I'm like, there's just no way. There's no way that this is better than than playing the one k. You know, it's just you know, if you hop in that, it's just like, well, if, if I hop in that, it's just pure ego. You know, right. A lot of the time. I mean, the the toughest tournament I ever played in my life was a 10k um, in the Bahamas. It was it was beyond a joke. It had like I had like 40 entries or something and like three were bad players something like that uh, i mean maybe maybe less uh it was just ridiculous i was playing like this table and it was just like it looked like it looked like the you know like 100k is like 100 like 100k final table it was like you know my middle of day day one you know and i was just so much regret for playing it you know <laughs> like i mean it's fun i guess uh to a degree to play with these guys, but it but it wasn't fun that time because I was just getting destroyed, you know. <laughs> it was a while ago, you know. <laughs> it's never, um, never fun when you get destroyed. Are you are you excited for the 25k PCA coming up here? The the 300, 300 platinum passes they've been giving away to, to random people all around the world. Are you excited for that event? Oh yeah. That that one that one I will play Joe. Uh, this is this is a high I really I think is definitely worth playing. Um yeah, I mean that's that's going to be the the second best tournament of the year, right? Next year, I assume. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it could be the first. I don't know. I mean, listen, they're giving away three hundred packages to random people who've never maybe a lot of them never played a ten k in their entire life. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't know if it, I don't know if it's possible for it to be better than the World maybe. Series Poker Main. Yeah, it's close because I mean you're talking about you know seven thousand people in that thing. I mean. The percentage of good players is just so astonishingly low. I mean, in this one, it's you know, 300 platinum passes. I mean, a good portion of them are going to be decent players. You know, I mean, yeah. it's a lot of tournament winners. 
a lot of people who won uh, satellites online, you know, yeah, okay, there's people who opened a chest and got in, right? <laughs> and and that's and that's great. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> or you know, some spinning goes, I guess, won it as well, right? But even some of them will be pros. And then or, and then all the high rollers are going, right? Like you know, or all the high roller regs, quite a all, lot of mid. All of the all of the regs, all everyone. Like is, every reg is going. Right. Yes. Right. Every reg and their dad, you know, like they're just. Everyone's coming out of the woodwork. They literally might buy their father into the event. That's that they that certainly could be a possibility with one high roller. I would not be surprised. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, I don't think it can be just the percentage of good players is going to be quite a lot higher um, than you, than the main event. Can you imagine getting a bad table in that? You go to your table and you're you're excited. You go finally we're going to see some fun players in the 25k, and then it's like a 100k high roller final table, and you look around, and you go motherfucker, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I found. That was my biggest uh, realization on tournaments was that these table draws, it's it's like you're at a good table, you got position on the fun player, you get changed to a new table, it's all it's all guys you know that you consider pretty good players, and it's just, uh, it, it, it can impact you so much, and it's just very random, it all seems like. I'm sure there's ways that maybe hack the system, I don't know exactly what those are, <laughs> there's ways people pay off the floors, I don't know what might might not be going on in these things like that, but... Yeah, me neither. I mean, I've heard rumors about stuff like that, um, but uh, but you know, very very much like Allegedly. Allegedly. In, in, in the past. There's sort of all sorts. There's all sorts of rumors I'm hearing. Who knows? Who knows what's true, what's not true out there? I don't. Uh, know. Who knows? I mean, I whatever. Know. I don't care. I mean, it's <laughs> like I I really like. I mean, uh, I just have no interest in in trying to like cheat for you know for anything, right? Like I I really have no interest in that like you know whatever it just sounds like i'm just sounds like i'm saying how great i am now <laughs> like, but, but like for me it's like i if if i found out that like this was was going on or whatever i just i mean obviously it would be pretty annoying but like i'm not i'm not looking for you know i'm not like hearing a rumor about something like this and being like oh my god you know like i must get to the bottom of this mm. Um, and also not trying to figure out how to do it myself either, you know, like, you know, I just, it's a good uh, it's, don't worry, yeah, because, don't let it sure. in your mind. Yeah. Let you, once you let it in your mind of what, what all the possibilities people could be doing that's out of line or what you could be doing, I think that can really, uh, fuck with you a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's like, the, like, you know, if, if like people are like talking a different language at the table or something and like, uh, um, it's just so, it's so easy to like start like getting that loop in your head of like hey like how could they be sharing information maybe they're using like code code words or something like you know and it, and it just like builds in your mind and you're like why isn't the dealer saying anything and they keep going you're like they should really say something and i'm like but this point like you know just just focus on your hand you know like this sort of thing and like trying to think about like you know table draw stuff and it's just it's just like be like water you know you just or yeah, I guess be like, well, you know, it just flows, just flows past, and it's all fine. Just forget about it. And and seat draw, like, I mean, sometimes you can like table select a bit, right? If there's if there's like uh, you know one table with with less players on it than the others, but that only works in like very small field tournaments, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and even then, it's like even then, I feel like it's almost like a a big risk because if you if you if you sit sit around wait for a good seat to open you know so like wait for a plus ev situation like where the where there's the best table and it has more seats open and then you buy in and then you pick the pick one of the other two tables or, or three or whatever and you get a really bad seat i feel like the amount of tilt that that would put you on like that would actually be like it might end up being like worse than if you had just ignored it in the first place you know, like the, the negative EV of picking the wrong one is like maybe worse than the, the positive EV of picking the right one. Maybe. Because now you're dwelling. If, if you get tilted by those things, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that would tilt me for sure. If I had, uh, if I, if I put that energy into like trying to, trying to like game Absolutely. select and then, yeah, exactly. Mm. So yeah. I try not to worry about this sort of shit, you know, like. Table draw is a table draw. I also, I find like quite a lot of the time I get moved to a really, really good table. Like, let's say I had like a tough table in a tournament where there shouldn't be that many tough tables, which sometimes happens. And you're like, okay, you know, I've got a battle here. <clears throat> and you're battling away and it's actually, you know, going well. You know, you're focused, you're, you're playing pretty hard and, and things are going well. 
and then you get moved to a table that's like super good and you're like oh my god i'm gonna absolutely crush here i find like i do really badly then quite often and you know again it's probably just random random chance but random variance but uh but i feel like the you get a little overexcited you like try and do too much you know now that you've got this good table and like mm -hmm. it ends up backfiring you know Make where fun. yeah where it's like it's good not to get excited or, or upset about these sorts of things you know and uh and just be like okay you know I, and i get I mean, i'm not saying i don't you know obviously this still happens like, i still get moved to a bad table i'm like damn it you know like i'm still still a bit tilt when i get a bad table and i still get a little excited when i get a good table but it's you know the, the goal is to not think like that you know the goal is to be like okay what you know what is the correct way to play at this table mm -hmm. amen to that amen to that tournaments maybe i'll play some tournaments i don't know i don't know normally i'd give shout outs to the chat right now but we have no li live chat so i'm just gonna give a shout out to um i don't know, you have a shout you want to give jack you want to give a sh shout out to somebody um well so i already shout out uh my boy wait who was it <laughs> i shouted out someone earlier but I Michael. yeah um uh, rakish right michael Marrakesh. right um he was in rosdorf uh henry kilbane the commentator who helped who was the rail there uh shout out to i don't know uh who, who's gonna be watching this uh my, my boy laurie always always trying to troll the chat he would definitely be trolling the chat right now but uh he hasn't made it um you know my family uh specifically my mum who had surgery recently and is like the ultimate champ and is already back at work mm. um i don't know man who else there's gonna be so many people there's just so many people that uh that are, that are probably a bit tilt that i haven't done given them a shout out yet um that, that tells but, yeah. you they're gonna have to learn from what you've been saying and, and get over it and realize that hey flow it's out of their control exactly get over it guys you know it is what it is on the spot you, uh, let's get a couple more questions and we'll wrap things up here. Do, what, what do you think is some bad advice that people give poker players out there? Do you think there's anything out there you hear, advice or strategy or something like that that you think they think's poor advice? Oh man, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's just so much. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, the, the the poker world is just full of of all this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, a lot of it is like, I, I mean, I feel like a lot of the, the things that people get wrong with poker is like doing something that's correct, but misapplying the concept, you know, like there's a lot of stuff where, where people are like, you know, trying to think in a, trying to think like a GTO style in a situation that just doesn't make sense, you know, or or you know doing or not thinking gto in a spot where you really should you know um so I, I find like there's not so much bad advice it's more like just like um misapplication of of ideas is is what people really get wrong a mm. lot you know um <clears throat> i mean i'll give you an example there's this thing that people are doing um these days where in the big blind if the small blind limps that some a solver has basically told people that you should raise complete garbage, right? Seven deuce off, like ten three off, whatever, you know, just complete garbage. Uh, and and people have basically just decided, like, okay, that's what I do then. And they haven't really like considered like how the small blinds actually playing once you know after this spot and um you know um or just anything. It's just like it's just like the solver says this, so that's it. You know, that's the end of the, like, that's the end of the train of thought. And look, I'm not saying I, I do it. Like sometimes that's the right strategy. You know, I've done it. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a, there's a hand in the WSP Europe final day where I raised 10, three off in this spot. Right. Um, but, but the, to just be like, okay, well, that's my range now, you know, and it's just like, you're, you're taking the concept and ignoring the reason for it you know uh the, the thing is like the reason the solvents are doing this is because you don't want to get limp three bet from the small blind and have to fold a hand with equity right that's the reason right so if you if you if you raise like 
seven five suited or something and get three bet. Actually, uh, this solve probably calls that hand anyway. But you know, like seven three suited, let's say, right? And then get three bet. You're like, damn, this hand could have really have flopped nicely. But when you have seven three off, you're like, well, if I check back, I'm flop crap anyway. Like, so it raises that. Well, that's all all well and good. But like, if you're playing as a small blind, that's just like gonna limp three bet you like you know two percent of the time, you know, or or whatever, and limp call tons, then you really would quite like to have a hand with some equity in it, you know, um, and there's so it, there's spots where like it makes a lot of sense to play these strategies that you know that people are coming up with and there's spots where they just totally don't and people are really bad at, at implementing these things in the correct way and i think like there's there's a bit of a it's like it's just people not asking why they're doing things you know and uh and they're trying to just sort of copy you know just trying to take a strategy and and that's like okay well that's the answer and i'm just gonna do that you know and, and it's not like, well, yeah, well, why? And all the best, all the best players, like, you know, whether they're, you know, this whole like GTO versus exploitative thing. It's like the the best GTO players are exploiting really well, and the best exploitative players also like are good at, you know, know the GTO stuff. You know, it's it's not that much difference in them in in, in the strategy. You know, it's just like it's more like a a mindset thing, um, and so like. You know, the problem is like a lot of people are just taking these these uh the ideas and just like taking them as a as rote, you know, and and not and not trying to figure out the reasoning behind them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think this. I mean, in terms of like bad advice, it's not it's not, it's not that much bad advice. Um, strategy wise, it's just like it's just misapplication of of um of ideas is the real issue. Mm. I mean. I mean, I'm sure there's some pretty bad advice as well, though. But like, obviously, I'm not watching these. Like, I'm not paying attention to to people that don't know what they're talking about. You know, I mean, that's the bang bang. Well, yeah, I mean, why, why would you? I yeah, don't know. I'm not. I'm not going to call out any names, right? But there's for sure guys with you know training sites or um, you know giving advice like out there that that are not giving good advice right there are people at um, training sites that are giving bad advice yes interesting okay uh, yeah i mean there's there's, pe there's people okay let, let me put it another way there's people that are making money from being a uh knowledgeable person for about poker right whatever that is mm -hmm. i don't want to be too specific right but like th there's guys making money from their poker knowledge that are, are giving bad advice right um and i i don't pay any attention to them so like i can't really give you an example <laughs> i can't give you too many examples you know right um but that's the one thing i would say i mean i give you some good advice which is to um you know hang around with people that are extremely good at poker if you want to get good i mean that's the number one thing for me for sure like you know uh, i was I, i'm you know i moved in with fullball and then now I just like, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm talking hands with like, you know, some of the best players in the world, like constantly, you know, and I have a really good uh, idea of, you know, how they think. And, and that's been, that's been the number one thing that's made, you know, that's, you know, it helped me improve my game. I mean, the other day when I was in the gym, I got a text from Sam Grafton, like asking me what I thought about some hand, you know? I'm like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> like this is the, this is, this is what's happening. You know? This is where I've come. Like, you know, two years ago, like, I'm like, I'm like watching his videos on Run It Once, like, you know, with a fucking notepad. Like, oh, yeah, this is really interesting. This guy really knows what he's talking about. And I was like, text me like, yo, right, mate, what do you think of this hand? Like, <laughs> it's crazy, huh? But that's what happens. You know, you you start you start hanging around with these people, and like, you just raise your level, like, mm -hmm. like automatically, you know. You just have to not be too much of an idiot at the start, or you just have to be really fun. It's like the other, you know. I, I would recommend that actually. The really good advice for poker players is improve your social skills, because a lot of you guys are a weird, insular, unfriendly people. Um, not you know, not to put every poker player, you know, uh, you know, not not to, not to be too, not to put too fine a point of it, but there's a lot of unfriendly weirdos in the poker world. And, um, you know, if, if you could, <laughs> I mean, if you're just fun to be around, you're going to get a lot of free coaching. 
That's true. And, people, people do and if you're not fun to be around, you're going to get, you're not even going to get a, get that much expensive coaching. You know, you could pay a lot for it. And like, if you're not fun to be around, like you just like are going to, even the pay, coaching you pay for isn't going to be as good, you know, mm-hmm. because they're just not going to be as interested in, in talking to you. And yeah, and here's some more advice. All right, I'm just going to like, this is another advice segment of the podcast. It's okay. But, uh, um, it's, it's get some goddamn coaching. Like, if you don't know any top poker players, then just, like, pay one of them, like, for sure. It's, like, the highest ROI thing you can do. Like, you, you I mean, well, I, I paid Philbot. Like, that's that's how I met him. Uh, you know, I, I paid him for, for an hour and a half of coaching. And, uh, I mean, you can you can guess, I mean, if you consider that, like, you know, I'd never played live before that, you know, I was playing, like, average buy-in of, like, 20 or something online, $20. And I have an hour and a half of coaching for Philbot and then move in with him like two months later and then you know then go on somewhat of a heater <laughs> i mean the roi of that coaching session has been pretty ridiculous i mean coaching is kind of like a reverse scam you know like you scam the coacher you get like you i mean it's it's like, it's like oh yeah i'm 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 offering coaching it's like you know, let's say let's say they charge a, a lot right like they charge like six hundred dollars for an hour i mean it seems like a lot right but then you pay six hundred dollars a few times and then you get like you know they'll talk to you about hands for like you know the rest of your life pretty much you know if you're good you know and and you you get you get good through through coaching with them they end up like swapping with you and stuff like it's just like that the roi is just so high just like if you could, you know, obviously, like you can't, af- not everyone can afford six hundred dollars, right? Right. But you, you should. It's if you can, then you should for sure do it. I like that. Like, it's a I really easy way to make friends with with good players, and and you just like, it's just so much better than than anything else. You know, these courses and stuff. Like, I think, uh, I th- I think if you're struggling, like an hour of coaching is probably going to be better than a thousand dollar uh poker product you know like a course or something yeah cor- courses are the new uh shout to upswing poker affiliate program they uh courses are definitely the new wave right now and i'm happy to be right in the middle of it with upswing poker and um i'll put a link in the description if you want to go check their courses out support the channel a little bit support the business <laughs> jack we're gonna run a business around here i'm running we should run yeah i mean i mean i i, I would, would like to do some more courses you know like i mean i, I do them right like I, i've got i was a member for upswing i've been a member of uh I run it was so a, a pokernerve.com member um i was i was i used to be a deuces crack member i mean I, i've been a member of of, every, of all of them you know right i've read a lot of poker books as well even you know how's that but like all of these things pale in comparison to uh, actually having one-on-one interaction with someone that's uh, that really knows what they're talking about you know right I like yeah, that. We, sa- we save we save that we save the actionable advice for people that they can implement today. We saved it for the end, but I'll I'll put this on Twitter for some of the people out there. We'll get them, sh- we'll share them share them a little bit of clip, share them a little bit of advice because I think people out there are looking for that advice and and yeah, I mean, I feel like coaching was something that I never really thought much about doing and I wish I did when I was younger. Let's put it like that because that would help me out a lot. But I always had I was always surrounded by good good poker players, so that was yeah. a very big part of my progression from becoming good for coming. You know, I feel like I was always winning even when I started playing micro stakes cash games, but that was certainly a big thing was I always had two to three friends. We talked poker nonstop all the time. So you're going to get better that way when you just talk poker nonstop with people around you. And it, it's good if they're also good players or they're winning too. But a lot of people out there ask me, where do I find good players? And you mentioned it, get your social skills better and then just start talking to people and then making friends and getting a phone number, texting hand histories and starting from there, I think it's a good start for a lot of people out there. Cause a lot of people ask me, where do I find poker players who are good or where do I make friends or whatnot? Yeah, I mean, play live poker, you know? <clears throat> the, like that would be, that's a good way, you know? You, you play live poker and like, you know, most of the people you play with are, you know, you know brain dead or, or whatever, but like, mm-hmm. Event, but that that actually makes it better, right? When you meet a, when you're playing live poker with a bunch of you know droolers, and then one guy like you actually play a hand against them, or or you see them playing a hand, or they see you playing a hand, and you actually do something good, or they do, 
it's really easy to make friends with them after that mm -hmm. because you'll be like, oh, you actually know what you're doing. Uh, you know, what's what's the deal? Like, you know, you you blah, 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 you blah, blah. You know? Let me get that number. Let me get that number, bro. Let me get that. Yeah. Slide in that DM. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, are, you want to be like a little bit, you know, careful that they don't think it's a romantic advance, but, you know, I'm sure you can yeah, always. Yeah, well, you always work. It's always right up front, right? 2018. It's okay. You know, yeah. Do whatever you got to do out there. It's all fine. <laughs> I'm not. There. I'm not recommending people give sexual favors uh, for uh, for, for poker coaching. FYI. Okay. I yeah. mean, I don't but know. you know, actually, you know, now you say. I mean, like, I mean listen, save like, some money, get get some enjoyment. I don't know, win win. I'm. You know, yeah. So that's the advice segment. It's like if, if you can't make friends with someone, pay them. If you can't pay them, you gotta you gotta seduce trade them. you gotta trade the body. <laughs> seduce them. I don't know how to feel about this. I feel like this story is funny, but I don't. You know, then maybe. Someone's gonna take offense to the story. I don't know. There are people these days. They're uh, they get so offended by everything out there. <laughs> well, okay, you can just edit it out then. Uh, I mean, but... no, not, I don't edit. I'm not editing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. ready. I'm ready to. Do. I never thought about that. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'll take that advice one day. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I'll get some podcast advice from Joe Rogan. Some coaching from Joe Rogan. If he doesn't, <laughs> coaching, I'll seduce him. That sounds. That sounds like my Tim Ferriss. I'm, I'm coming for you, Tim Ferriss. Yeah, that sounds good for you, buddy. All right, let's leave him. Let's leave him up with uh, one piece of life advice, Big Jack. Give him, give him one piece of life advice, Jack. Give him some, some. Give him. Uh, uh, we we spoke on poker. We've given them some poker advice. Give him some life related to go out on here. Even though you said a few good things during this podcast, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, um, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, it's the, the same advice still applies, right? Like improve your po improve your social skills, for sure. Is like the number one uh, highest highest EV thing you could do in life you know um but yeah i mean there's i think people get a, a little bit too further in that you know when it comes to improving your social skills it's not about like you know the techniques and the you know like how you actually interact and, and all that sort of stuff because you know that just sort of like it is important but you know you you develop that just by you know being sociable in the first place uh, but there's a quote that I really love from from a book, um, uh, a, a pretty wacky book called Power Versus Force. But the, the quote is genuinely uh, warm and uh, what is it? Genuinely warm and friendly people have more friends than they can count. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Just genuine, just to be, just be like, just focus on being a genuinely good person, you mm -hmm. know open warm and and friendly and that's it like and everything else just falls into place really quickly you know in in terms of that and uh yeah i mean i think that that quote has really stayed with me you know um even though i couldn't I quite even though i couldn't quite remember the wording of it but you get the gist you know for sure um i would recommend that book very much but it is very wacky like it's uh it's um it's it's out there. Let's let's put it like that. And uh, and if you do read it because of this, don't assume that I believe everything that's in there because it is a little bit uh, kooky. Mm. But yeah, power versus force. Power Very, versus force. We'll, yes, I like you, that. You, we'll, we'll leave the people on that note there, Jack. If you want to follow Jack's worldwide adventures, you can do it on Instagram at Jack's Incredible. Very modest name, Jack's Incredible. <laughs> also on Twitter. Jack's crib as well. We'll be following along with Jack's adventure here as he continues on with uh, with his poker success potentially out there and as he gets on the grind. And uh, yeah, that's it, Jack. Any last parting words for the people? Hi, man. It's been a blast. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. And uh, no yeah, to everyone watching, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I called you uh, uh, unfriendly widows, but uh, you know. They're not. Not my audience. They're, they're all. <laughs> we got a lot of winning poker players. A lot of sociable guys. They're there. They're there. Everyone loves them. They're smiling all the time. They're positive lighthouses. This isn't Doug, this ain't this ain't my buddy Doug Polk's audience. This is my audience. All right. Different, <laughs> different people here. No shot. No shots either. Come on. It's true. Or no, not no bang bang. It's a, it's a fact. So, all right. That's it, guys. Take care. Be back tomorrow if you're watching this um, with a new video. And uh, that's it.